talk about uh, adaptive management and resilience, and uh, so I plan to do so. I'm first going to talk a little bit about how I view resilience, because there's been several definitions thrown out. Talk about adaptive management. This is cut down from an hour-long talk I gave a week or two ago in Sweden, so I realized in the amount of time I have that it's going to be just sort of a 10,000-foot overview. I really like scenarios and scenario planning, and one thing I'll, I'll sort of show here is the differentiation when and when scenarios are relevant and when adaptive management might be more relevant because they fit in fairly neatly into uh, analysis of, of controllability and uncertainty in your system and what you can do. Um, so I've been involved with resilient stuff for some, some time. In 1997, there was a, a, an alliance formed called the Resilience Alliance, which was a social scientist, ecologist, and economist to explore the ideas of resilience and try to foster interdisciplinary approaches to understanding resilience. <coughs> I think um, that that group has probably been fairly successful in about 2008, seven years ago, more or less, we were meeting in Corsica, and Ken Wilson, the, the director of the Christensen Fund, who was funding us at the time, uh, started off our meeting, he said two things. He said, well, I have good news and bad news. And the good news is resilience is out. You're successful. It's everywhere now. Bad news is, it's not yours anymore. You don't get to define it. It's out and it's out of your hands. And he's right. <laughs> so, but towards that end, I do want to sort of talk about how ecologists and sort of the hauling school, if you will, thinks of resilience and what it is. Not that it's actually very different. I think all of these definitions we talked about are very are very related and we could actually unify them pretty easily. But there's a couple little differences. And, and I think the, the basic idea of resilience, ecological resilience, and I should preface that and I won't say it anymore, but when I'm talking, I'm talking always that term ecological resilience, um, was from the recognition that, that ecological systems could, could occur in alternative stable states. And this was the um, focused the Pauling's 1973 seminal paper on, on resilience, which was ignored for 30 years. Actually, it was harshly attacked um, at first, and that squelched resilience work for years. And it only took, or it only sort of started to flourish as we started to develop longer time series and more data looking at these complex systems to understand that alternative stable states were possible. So lakes, for example, classic Sheffer Carpenter kind of case can be in clear states or eutrophic unclear states. And the, really the driving variable here is phosphorus and it's fairly simple. And there's a flip that occurs. It's usually a slow driving variable, phosphorus or climate in the case of say the flip between the Sahel being in a green, green state to a desert, semi-desert state 5,000 5, years ago. A slow change in a driving variable re, um, <coughs> resulting in a rapid threshold change in the system of interest. <coughs> so lest you think, um, I'm missing my nice coral picture. <laughs> uh, unless, l apparently that state doesn't exist. <laughs> lest, so, so my definition of resilience then following hauling is simply a, the amount of disturbance a complex system needs to flip from one stable or dynamic really state to another. But lest you think that this is all this ecology and we don't care about it, most of these ideas are applied to complex social ecological systems. And I'll give a couple examples. One which I can only give verbally is, is from Nebraska, uh, but actually from the entire Great Plains where we are witness right now to an extremely broad wide-ranging state change in the entire Great Plains as it's transitioning very rapidly, 40,000 acres a year in Nebraska from grassland to juniper woodland. And you could say, well, so what? So a little grassland birds, who cares? Well, in places like Nebraska, society depends on those grasslands for the production of agricultural goods livestock, and the response of the systems is very much threshold. Little cedars come in, they're small, until about 30%, there's no impact on productivity, then suddenly there's this rapid change, it, productivity changes, and it becomes very difficult to flip the system back, and it affects society. More importantly, it's also a, a result of society because the driving process in those grasslands is fire, and people have uh, limited fire effects 
in these systems. Ah, there's a good coral. <laughs> Strange. Um, another lesson um, that Holling, what, that drove um, Holling's original ideas, and, and let me state also that resilience and adaptive management were both, ecological resilience and adaptive management, were both sort of dreamed up by Holling. And adaptive management was developed as a safe to fail method to probe systems and understand their dynamics without causing them inadvertently to go through one of these transitions. And we've heard a lot about disturbance here. Um, well, we've heard a couple things. It, it, one sort of lesson from natural resources is that when you, you seek to optimize a single resource, the result is sometimes surprise as other resources uh, change. And even though the resilience of what, for what, to whom is very important, anytime you really start to get a strategy to a single perturbation, say, um, put up a, a barrier for, for advancing armies because you know you're, they're going to come right at you, anytime you do that, you're probably getting weaknesses elsewhere in the system. So it's sort of a, a, a conundrum, if you will, and problematic. Another issue with these complex systems is, of course, hysteresis. I heard this best described by uh, some business people who describe it as being when the path in is not the same as the path out. And it's really the case that it's harder to flip a system back after it's flipped sometimes than it is for it to, to have flipped in the first place. Let me give you an example from Nebraska. This is a river system ecology, but my interest is the Greater Platte River Basin, which is a social ecological system with the river providing water to agricultural and cities and people, etc., etc. Originally, the river itself was driven by flooding processes. They scoured the river and then it provided habitat for terns and plovers and other species. Humans come along, dam the river. This is good for social economic aspects of the system. You know, that boosts economic output and everything else. So resilience in those sides of the system is enhanced, while the ecological side has eroded and become extremely hysteretic. This is the river now. Damming has prevented floods. That has meant that the tree, uh, the islands have, are no longer sand covered and they've been invaded by trees. Why does society care? Well, there's an Endangered Species Act. And so FERC relicensing kicked in because this is no longer breeding habitat for cranes, terns, and blovers. Uh, Endangered Species Act kicked in. This stops the dams from being relicenses. This starts 13 years in negotiation between Colorado and Wyoming and Nebraska and results in an enormous adaptive management project costing something like $200 million to all of us to try to experiment and restore the river. So it does have impacts on humanity as well. Hysteresis here, you'd think, and there are experiments going on, that you could just flood the river again, right? That was the process. And it would scour the sandbars, and we could get turns and plovers breeding again, and the ecological side of things would be great. But no, hysteresis means that these channels have become incised. They've become armored with trees. So you've got to remove the trees. So instead of just returning the process, you've got to come cut the trees. Under the trees, we have had invasions of Phragmites, an invasive uh, grass. And Phragmites, you'd have to spray and treat, but its structure is very persistent. So you actually would have to go bulldoze that too out. Then maybe you could get the process working again. It's difficult. So. Of course, social systems, ecological systems are intricately linked, so it doesn't make sense to really talk about one versus the other. Um, and I would contend that when a system is in a desirable state, not undesirable state, that it's in our interest to enhance, and here's the process to foster and enhance this, the resilience of a system that is in a desirable state. If it's not in a desirable state, we wouldn't want to do that. And you might claim it's a precautionary approach when sort of probabilistic risk assessment uh, techniques are not possible. So adaptive management, Buzz Hollings quotes, and um, I have a book that came out this year on adaptive management. And the, the only good thing about that book is that we got an interview with Buzz Holling and asked him, you know, you haven't written anywhere. What was the genesis of AM? And so he interviewed and drew that out into a chapter in the book. So it's might be worth reading just for that. And he quotes in there, and he's probably uh, getting this from elsewhere, but the, the adaptive management is simply common sense, but that common sense is not actually very common. And adaptive management is indeed 
pretty straightforward. I could go into details. I don't have time, but I won't. But the, 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 the basics of the AM are pretty simple. Lance Gunderson, a friend of mine, has also stated that uh, adaptive management is an anecdote for spurious certitude. As humans, we like to go in and manage systems. We manage everything. And we like to think that we know what we're doing. Reality is there's always uncertainty inherent. And we need approaches that embrace that uncertainty and reduce it over time. So adaptive management is developed for when, uh, when there's uncertainty in our management and embraces that uncertainty by treating management as experiments in an iterative process, which is not trial and error. It's not doing something and then saying, oh, that didn't work. I'll do something else. So a couple contrasts. Uh, conventional management, natural resources versus AM, uh, precise predictions versus a range of potential scientific consensus versus embracing alternatives, like we might do in scenarios, short-term objectives over long-term. Um, best action from obvious alternatives to imaginative potential options, uh, certainty in, in your actions versus evaluating and learning and acknowledging that uncertainty and looking to sort of optimize equilibrium states versus expecting change and learning from it. Um, so science, we know, can't address problems. So in, in a lot of our complex systems, we're talking about control and replication, these things really aren't possible. So there's, there is always this basic uncertainty. So AM falls in, and it falls in not for all types of problems. It only falls in for problems where there is, is high uncertainty. If we're certain about how our system will respond to management, we don't need adaptive management, we just need to manage. And if uncertainty is high and controllability is also high, or, or uh, controllability is low, then we do scenarios because we can't change things. So, so adaptive management is good for that situation where you can control, where you can actually do management on the ground, but you're uncertain to, of the response. But there is that controllability. An example, Florida Bay, Lance Gunderson's example. Um, here's a system that was crashing. Uh, Waiting birds were dying, the, the, the bay was turning brown, so it was eutrophizing and, and we we're losing seagrass. And there's a lot of uncertainty about why. And each group of stakeholders involved had their own favorite hypotheses. So the outhouse bay, too many nutrients. You can imagine that the sugarcane farmers were advocates of this one. The um, strangled bay. This is because of canals uh, leaving water out of the Everglades. You can be pretty sure that city of Miami wasn't advocating for that one. So there's uncertainty. So the idea is let's get everybody's ideas on the ground and do experiments with water delivery in the Everglades and build models and evaluate them over time in an iterative learning process. Another example, maybe more germane to folks here, is in Cleveland and several other Midwestern cities. Um, we heard about Baltimore, there's urban decay. A lot of these cities are out of compliance with the Clean Water Act, so you, you get rules, EPA and rules coming in, and they gotta get into compliance, and, and infrastructure rebuilding is expensive. So there's these ideas of putting in green infrastructure. It's being done in Cleveland and elsewhere in an adaptive management sense. Let's take urban lots and put them into um, rain gardens and things like this and, and, and learn over time about what works to reduce storm water input into the sewer system. So it can work in urban systems as well. AM is simply this um, loop of setting objectives, doing experiments, putting out the hypotheses, reevaluating over time and learning as you go in in an iterative process. There's a lot more to that than that, but I'm just giving you that quick and dirty. All you really need for AM is two or more predictions under models, and some sequential decision making and then monitoring the system over time. I don't have time, we don't talk, haven't really, we've talked about the edges about, of governance and law, adaptive governance we think of as being governance that enables adaptive management and there's a role for law and governance in these kind of things. 
Uh, Florida failed terribly, failed for a lot of reasons. I won't go through this. Uh, Lance and I wrote a paper a few years ago that we named in a pretty depressing way um, that, that covers all the reasons why adaptive management fails. Largely it fails because it's being applied to systems that are huge, that are non-replicated, and that are highly controversial, and the process gets hijacked, usually. Um, finally, a couple things. We, we talked about panarchy a little bit. Uh, I wish I could have talked about panarchy because it's, it's very interesting. We see it come up several times. A panarchy is sort of a hierarchical uh, system model where at a given scale you have adaptive cycles of renewal and destruction occurring, and those adaptive cycles are nested in space and time. So you have sort of a, a hierarchy, but it's different than a traditional hierarchy in that bottom-up revolt in the system is also possible. All control isn't top down. We can see that in the Baltimore case where the city per se may be resilient in a good case, but when you scale down to neighborhoods, particular neighborhoods may be in very undesirable states. If a lots of neighborhoods in synchrony became undesirable, the city itself might crash. So scale is really important here. We haven't really talked about it, but I just throw that out. If you want to learn more, wrote a book on this um, just this year. And the law thing, which is very interesting to me, we had a book come out last year, and I don't know if folks are, how much folks are reading in the ecological resilience, but uh, Buzz and Lance and I have a foundations book that came out a few years ago too, if you're interested in that ecological literature. Thanks. Great, thanks Craig. Okay, a few questions before we bring the full panel up. Uh, Igor? Uh, so, uh, in Panarchy Policy, um, one of the ideas that I uh, have, and I send you a paper, but it may be worth brainstorming, like Giselle showed yesterday that society goes through this cycle and, you know, historically we have to collapse before we get to the better level, that's your panarchy. So is resilience, or can you view resilience as the process that would allow us to get a new state without collapsing? Um, I think that's where the process comes in, in that you, you certainly can foster and build resilience, and that's the process. And you would only do that when you're in a desirable state, because there certainly are plenty of systems in many of our urban systems we can think of so, and, and also lots of sub-Saharan um, um, agriculture, per se, are in sort of undesirable trapped states. We don't want to build and foster resilience of those. We want to do the opposite. We want to erode it and collapse the system, as you, as you said. But if you are in desirable state, so we're talking about we like to get better or stay there. So what is the difference then uh, between resilience, adaptive management, adaptive capacity, or is it more or less like you know different shades of gray mm. around that? Well, I think adaptive management is clearly different because it, it's simply a way to learn of, about the system. Adaptive uh, or resilience and adaptive capacity often get very conflated and, and are very tightly linked, if you will. Uh, both Roger and Jose are jumping out of their seats. I'll go uh, over Jose. Okay. No, I uh, trust you, my dear. If, if, if you don't mind, could you just go back to the previous slide? Previous one. The, the one after, the one before, where you listed the fail, right? Yep. So, um, learning is critical, always has been, right? What I call learning and not doing. Strong opposition to experimental policies by stakeholders protecting self-interest. How does learning take place in an environment like that? I, I think that's one of those uh, Barriers that can that can prevent learning or or, or or hijack a collaborative adaptive management process. I mean, so, so because and the reason why I'm saying this is a lot of what we're talking about pretty much assumes either no confounding factors or agreement on learning from experimentation, yeah. and yet that has been the biggest barrier to implementation of learning processes across civilizations, right? Mm -hmm. Much less for that since the Northwest Power Planning Act in 1980, this has been the case. A absolutely, it can hijack any adaptive management process if a, if a certain group of stakeholders is, is resolute in, in holding on to their cherished notions and re re not learning from experiments. Make sure we don't background that yeah. mm -hmm. in order to simplify some cybernetic system, <laughs> yeah. hopes of a system that is adapting. Absolutely. Yeah, totally agree. Just to finish, uh, follow up on Igor and uh, Roger, um, I think that, um, and you were talking about that too, uh, about the continuity between adaptive management and resilience. Because in adaptive management, you are uh, dealing in a way with the problem. 
And with the way, uh, and you talked about having uh, data about uncertainty or not and so on, while in resilience we have to describe the, the state of the state of the system, but we have to be much more broader in terms of uh, what are the, the probably manners that we're going to be confronting. And therefore, we have to evaluate uh, the state of the state in the social and the socio-ecological stuff. Then, if we see this, then it is nicely, it's nicely continuation between adaptive management and resilience, and it is not contradictory. It's a thing that just follows. Because in detective managing, you have really to respond to a certain problem, while in reason and resilience, we have to be more broader. <coughs> then uh, it's, it's beautiful, you know, follows, no problem.